Hi, Pop Stars, back for the Quarantine Read Aloud series. Today, we will be continuing our reading of Lauren Tarshi's I Survived the Sinking of the Titanic, 1912, with chapters 7 and 8. Just thinking about seeing the mummy made George happy. He went down five flights of stairs to G-Deck and practically skipped along the long hallway toward the front of the ship. He ducked into doorways a few times to hide from the night stewards, but he had no trouble finding his way, not like Phoebe, who got lost walking from the dining room to the washroom. Next time, I'll leave a trail of breadcrumbs, like Hansel and Gretel, she said, their first day on board. How about lemon drops, George had suggested. Phoebe had giggled. The hold was in the very front of the ship, past the mail sorting room, and the cabins where the stokers and firemen stayed. Too bad George thought that there wasn't time to sneak in and see the escape ladders. Luckily, there were two more days at sea. George walked right through the doors of the first-class baggage room and down a steep metal staircase that led to the hold. All around him were crates and trunks and bags neatly stacked on shelves and lined up on the floor. It took him a minute to figure out that everything was arranged in alphabetical order by the owner's names and a few minutes to find the bees. And that, and there it was, a plain wooden crate stamped with the words, Mr. David Burroughs, New York City, contents fragile. George smiled to himself. This was going to be easy. He took out his knife and he started to pry off the lid. He worked carefully prying each nail loose so he'd be able to close the crate tight again when he was finished. He made it halfway around when he heard a strange sound. The hair on his arms prickled. It was the same feeling he had the night of the panther, that someone or something was watching him. George stared at the crate, his heart pounding, and before he could even take a breath, something leaped out of the shadows and pushed him to the ground. George looked up, half expecting to see a mummy rising out of the crate, her arms reaching for George's throat. What he saw was almost as terrifying. It was a man with glittering blue eyes and a scar running down the side of his face. He grabbed George's knife out of his hand. The man was small, but very strong. I'll take this, he said, admiring it. Then he looked George up and down. So, the man said, trying to fill your pockets with some first-class loot. George realized he must be a robber. George had caught him in the act. Uh, no, I'm the man pointing to George's boots. Which trunk did you steal those from? Costs more than a third-class ticket, I'd say. George shook his head. I got them in London, he said, and too late realized he'd made a mistake. Ah, a prince from first class, the man said with a hearty laugh. Just down here for a little thrill? What's your name? George, said George softly. Prince George, the man said, bowing in a joking way. A pity those boots won't fit me, he added standing up, but you do have something I'd like, your key. Always wanted to see one of those first-class cabins. There was no way George could let this man up to the suite. He jumped overboard before he let him near Aunt Daisy and Phoebe. There's a mummy down here, he blurted out. It's worth millions. It's in this crate. The man raised an eyebrow. George kept talking. I thought I could sneak off the ship and sell it in New York, George lied. My father's business is bad, and I thought if I could sell it, the man looked at the crate. I like the way you think, he said. He waved the knife at George and told him not to move, and then he quickly worked the knife around the lid. Obviously, he had done this many times before. He lifted the lid off the crate, but before either of them could look inside, there was a tremendous rumbling noise, and the entire hold began to shake so hard that George almost fell. The shaking got stronger and stronger, the noise louder and louder, like thunder exploding all around them. A trunk tumbled off a shelf and hit the scar-faced man in the head. The knife clattered to the floor, but George didn't try to get it. Here was his chance to escape. He spun around, ran up the stairs, and darted out the door. Chapter 8 George ran as fast as he could down the hall. He heard shouting behind him, but he didn't stop until he was back on B-deck, safe again in first class. A steward hurried past him with a stack of clean towels. Good evening, sir, he said. George nodded, out of breath. Nothing could happen to him up here, he knew. So why was his heart still pounding? It was the ship. 
he realized that thundering noise, that shaking in the hold, had a boiler exploded, had a steam pipe burst? An eerie silence surrounded him, and George's heart skipped a beat as he realized that the engines had been turned off. The quiet rumbling had stopped. Just outside, George heard people talking loudly. Did they know what was happening? George went out into the deck and walked over to the small crowd of men. Most were still dressed in their dinner tuxedos and puffing on cigars. They were standing at the rail, pointing and laughing at something happening on the well deck, one level below. What was so funny? George squeezed between two men and looked over the rail. At first, he was sure his eyes were playing tricks. It looked like the well deck had been through a winter storm. It was covered with ice and slush. A bunch of men in tattered coats and hats were pelting each other with balls of ice, roaring with laughter like kids having a snowball fight. What's happened? asked a man who'd walked up behind George. The ship nudged an iceberg, said an old man with a bushy mustache. He didn't sound worried. An iceberg? Is that why they've stopped the engines, the, said the new man, because of some ice on the deck? Just being cautious, it seems, following regulations, said the older fellow. I spoke to one of the officers. He assured me we'll be underway any moment. Hey there, he yelled down to the young men below. Toss some of that ice up here. One of the gang picked up a piece of ice the size of a baseball. He threw it, but the man with the bush bushy mustache missed. George reached out, made a clean catch with one hand. The crowd cheered. George held up the ice and smiled. Then he held it out to the man. Keep it, son, he said. There's plenty for everyone. The piece of ice was heavier than George had expected. He sniffed it and wrinkled his nose. It smelled like old sardines. More ice balls came sailing up from below, and the men jostled to catch them. Their laughter and cheers rose up around George, and he feared he'd let the baggage hold fade away. From up here, on the deck of his incredible ship, of this incredible ship, George felt powerful. Nothing could hurt him on the Titanic. Not a meteor falling from space, not a giant squid, not the scar-faced man. George squinted out into the distance, hoping to see the iceberg, but the sea faded into darkness. His teeth were chattering now. It was so much colder than it had been at dinner time. He wanted to be back in bed, curled up under his fancy first-class sheets and blankets. The corridor was still quiet as George, crept toward, as George crept toward his suite. As he was letting himself in, he stepped on something that made a crunching sound under his boot. At first, George thought it was ice or a piece of glass, but then he picked up his heel and saw that the carpet was covered with yellow crystals. George smiled. It, must, it was just one of Phoebe's lemon drops. George let himself in, easing the door shut. Phoebe's bed curtains were closed. The light under Aunt Daisy's door was off. George quickly changed into his pajamas and climbed into bed. Yes, he was safe, he told himself. He tried to go to sleep, but as the minutes ticked by, his mind got restless. It hit him that his knife was gone forever, and the total silence of the ship seemed to press down on him. Why hadn't the engines started up again? He lay wide awake, listening and wondering. It was almost a relief when he heard someone knocking on their door. And that's the end of chapter 8. We'll see you back next time for chapters 9 and 10. Have a great day.